Final day of the year in the church calendar today is, and for Henry Holloman, it has nothing to do with the fact that Georgia beat Florida last night. <laughs> the church calendar. I've said this before, but I've grown to deeply love the seasons of the church year. Today is All Saints Sunday. It's a day when we stop to remember those saints who have gone before us. In the New Testament, a saint was anyone who followed Jesus Christ. You're a saint. So today we remember those who impacted the church, universal, like Stephen and Paul and Peter. We remember Augustine and Cranmer and Ridley and Latimer, and we are thankful for Wesley and Whitfield and Edwards. We remember Spurgeon and Eliot and Wimber and Lewis and thousands more. But also today we remember those who have impacted our lives individually, who have gone on to be with the Lord. I remember my grandparents. My, my dad's father led worship at a little country Baptist church when I was a kid and when he passed away, my other grandfather took over. So both of my grandfathers led, led worship in a little Baptist church on a textile mill village outside Noonan, Georgia called Arnco. My grandparents, Willie and Julie Prince and Vernon and Baina Cottle. Yeah, that's really their names. <laughs> my grandmother Julie's middle name was Carlista. I have no idea where that came from. I remember my father. Gene Prince, Sr. I remember my father-in-law who passed away this year, Max Crisp. I remember men and women who impacted my life. I remember my first pastor, Bob Baggett. I remember an influential youth pastor, Ron Davis. All of those who have died in the Lord and all of these made a difference. Today is also special because it's one of the two days of the year along with Easter Sunday or Easter Vigil when historically as Anglicans we celebrate the sacrament of holy baptism. Today we will celebrate Aaron's initiation into the church. As we were talking before the service, the thing that she was most excited about was that since communion follows baptism this morning, she doesn't have to come and cross her arms. She gets to participate at the table of the Lord, and we're excited about that. Today's also special because in our neck of the woods, it comes on the hills of our annual Diocesan Synod, which was held the last couple of days over in Loganville. As I stood yesterday before uh, the gathered delegates and observers to lead the group in noonday prayer. Dean David, you'll appreciate this, but I made the remark that it was such a joy to gather for an official diocesan event where the primary emphasis was the gospel of Jesus Christ and not politics. Amen. Bishop Foley, in his address on Friday night, challenged all of us gathered to be joyful Christians, and he walked through the entire book of Philippians. We would not be angry Christians, or resentful Christians, or grumpy Christians. It's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? <laughs> but that we would be joyful Christians. And then yesterday he challenged us to go fishing. To go fishing, to be about the business of evangelism in the church. In the New Testament, the church is presented as the bride of Christ. The church has been left in the earth to validate the claims of Jesus Christ. The church has been left to do the work that Jesus Christ himself began. If you want to know how healthy a church is, and the greatest evaluation is to see how much that church looks like Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed how couples, and I'm not going to pick on David and Jenny this morning, but how couples who have, who have been married for a really long time, much longer than they've been married, 
60 or 70 years, how they start to look like each other. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> so it is with the, with the church and the Redeemer of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. We should look more and more and more like Him the longer we walk with Him. To tie in with the many challenges of this day, I want us in preparation for baptism to look at today's gospel reading in Luke chapter 19. If you would turn there, please. In this snapshot, we see another picture of Jesus. And what I want to say to you is this story is more than just a song that we learned in first grade Sunday school class. You remember Zacchaeus was a wee little man? A wee little man was he? The problem with learning cute little songs like that is that really impactful stories can lose their power. Because this story is more than just about a wee little man. This is about a big God. Luke 19, verse 1, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Again, we see this so often. Jesus is just on his way. He's passing through. He's going through Jericho. To me, Jesus, if you look throughout the, new, the, the gospel accounts, most of what Jesus does in his life happened as he was on his way. He's passing by. He's traveling. He's doing this. But he's, his antenna are always up. He's always looking. He's always seeking out people that he encounters. He wasn't really going to Jericho to stay there, but there's a man there who would have been despised by those who lived there. We talked about tax collectors last Sunday. He was a rich tax collector. Probably the most despised man in Jericho. Zacchaeus. And what we gather from this passage, my interpretation is, that Zacchaeus wasn't necessarily a happy man. His wealth had not satisfied him. If it did, he would have had no need to be seeking out Jesus. But he did seek him out. In fact, he wanted to see him so desperately. The crowds were so great, he couldn't see over those in front of him who were taller. He climbs up into a tree so he can get a good view of Jesus as he came by. I don't think Zacchaeus really expected an encounter with Jesus. He just wanted to see, well, who is this guy that I've heard so much about? The stories are incredible. He's coming through my town. I want to see him. He didn't expect an encounter with him. He was intrigued by him and wanted to see what all the fuss was about. Verse 3, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he couldn't because he was small. So he ran on ahead, climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. But Jesus, with his antenna up, had other plans for Zacchaeus. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. What we're going to find out is Jesus didn't want to just talk to Zacchaeus. He wanted to change his life. He wanted to change his life. I want to come to your house. I want to get to know you. And more importantly, I want you to get to know me. The love that Jesus showed to people made a difference. Zacchaeus was exuberant and his desire to have Jesus come to his house. And how often do we see this in Scripture? And when they saw it, they, the, the crowd, when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Church, if you never hear anything else, understand this. Jesus was looking for sinners. They couldn't have been more wrong in their assessment. There will always be those in the church, I've been at this long enough to know this, 
who will resent it when the Holy Spirit shows up in the church and begins to change lives. Amen. Don't be that person. Don't be that person. We always check what the Holy Spirit is doing, but we need the Holy Spirit to move among us, to move in power among us, to be that extension of the Lord Jesus who says to those who come our way, come down, I, I want to go to your house, I want to talk to you, I want to I love you today. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. fourfold. Somewhere in this encounter, Zacchaeus' life was transformed. Do you, see, do you see what happened here? He's the most despised man in, in all of Jericho. He encounters Jesus Christ, and somehow in that encounter, his life is changed. We see in it the change in his life, the change in his heart, resulted in a change in the way he lived his life. He became a giver. Not just a taker. And today Jesus and Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Dear church, can I tell you this morning that there is no higher call for the church of Jesus Christ than to seek and to save that which is lost. No higher call. How many of you came to know Jesus Christ before you were 20 years old? Raise your hand. Probably 60, 70 percent. How can we make a difference in the lives of those in our community who are under the age of 20? More Christians come to Christ before the age of 20 than any other stage of life. How are we going to do that? My son was sharing at a seminar yesterday, and he said when, when he got ready to leave seminary, he went to one of his favorite professors and had coffee with him, and he asked him this question. He said, what would be the one thing you would say to a man who's about to leave seminary and enter into parish life? The guy thought for a minute and looked at him and said that the goal of your life would be to be found faithful more than to be found successful. Amen. To be found faithful. Kurt Benham, who's one of the pastors at the Village Church at Vinings, which is a sister church of ours in ADOTS, we were gathered for our convocation meeting and I was just asking guys to tell us a little bit about their story. And He was talking about their church. He said, he said you know, we've become a church for addicts. He said, we, we've got addicts coming out of the woodwork. And I said, how did that happen, Kurt? He said, well, somehow one addict found his way to our church, and we loved him and cared for him and led him into a relationship with Jesus Christ, and all of his addict friends followed. So basically what he said, the way we become a church full of addicts is, we love them in the same way that Jesus Christ loves them. We don't judge them. We love them and we bring hope into their lives and their lives are changed. Church, at the end of the day, the greatest teaching and preaching will not build a church. The most happening youth ministry or the slickest children's ministry will not build a church. The greatest choir and the most gifted worship band will not build a church. The genuine love of Jesus Christ will build a church. Jesus said this, he said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. And then listen to this, church. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. The love of God is the most powerful force in the universe. 
It's the love of God that will help us to become all that God has for Resurrection Anglican Church to be. I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know, but I, but I promise you this. God knows how it's going to happen. God's got a plan, and we've got to find our way to our knees to discover it together. How does God want us to make a difference in the community where we're planted? He doesn't want to withhold that from us. He wants to reveal it to us if we're willing to seek Him. You may have heard the name Kirsten Powers. Kirsten Powers is a contributor to USA Today, a columnist for Newsweek magazine. She's a Democratic commentator at Fox News. And I want you to hear her story and her words. She said, just seven years ago, if someone had told me that I'd be writing for Christianity Today magazine about how I came to believe in God, I would have laughed out loud. If there's one thing in which I was completely secure, it was that I would never adhere to any religion, especially to evangelical Christianity, which I held in particular contempt. I grew up in the Episcopal Church in Alaska. But my, my belief was superficial and flimsy. It was borrowed from my archaeologist father, who was so brilliant he taught himself to speak and read Russian. When I encountered doubt, I would fall back on the fact that he believed. Leaning on my father's faith got me through high school. But by college, it wasn't enough, especially because as I grew older, he began to confide in me his own doubts. What little faith I had couldn't withstand this revelation. From my early 20s on, I wavered between atheism and agnosticism, never coming close to considering that God could be real. After college, I worked in the Clinton White House for six years. I was surrounded with intellectual people who if they had any deep faith in God, never talked about it. Later I moved to New York where I worked in democratic politics. It became aggressively secular. Everyone I knew was politically left-leaning and my group of friends was overwhelmingly atheist. Life actually seemed pretty wonderful, filled with opportunity and good conversation and privilege. I didn't feel as though I was missing very much. So I began dating a man who was into Jesus. I wasn't looking for God. In fact, the week before I met him, a friend asked me if I had any deal breakers in my dating. My response, just nobody who is religious. <laughs> a few months into our relationship, my boyfriend called to say he had something important to talk about. I remember exactly where I was sitting in my West Village apartment when he said, do you believe Jesus is your Savior? My stomach sank. I started to panic. My first thought was, he's crazy. <laughs> when I answered no, he asked, do you think you could ever believe it? He explained that he was at a point in his life when he wanted to get married and felt that I could be that person, but he couldn't marry a non-Christian. I said, I don't want to mislead you, but I will never believe in Jesus. Then he said the magic words for a liberal. Do you think you could keep an open mind about it? <laughs> well, of course, I'm very open-minded, even though I wasn't at all. <laughs> I derided Christians as anti-intellectual bigots who were too weak to face the reality that there is no rhyme or reason to the world. I had found this man's church attendance an oddity to overlook, not a point in his favor. As he talked, I grew conflicted. On the one hand, I was creeped out. On the other hand, I had enormous respect for him. He was smart, he was educated, he was intellectually curious. And I remember thinking, what if this is true and, not, and I'm not even willing to consider it? 
few weeks later, I went to church with him at Redeemer Presbyterian on the Upper East Side of New York. I was shocked and repelled by what I saw. I thought.